afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year, and welcome to the 2022 new edition of Barometer's Tuesday afternoon webcasts. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and joining me today is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer. On today's webcast, we will provide you with a brief macro overview, and uh, as well at the tail end of the conversation, we will open up the floor to questions, so please don't be shy. Please hit me up on the Zoom chat or email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca. And with that, I turn the conversation over to our very own David Burroughs. Happy New Year, David. Great to see your face and thrilled to be back for this year's uh, webcast. Thanks, Pam. Thanks so much for, for hosting today. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, here we are in a new year. And uh, of course, everybody is thinking about their portfolios and thinking about what worked last year and what didn't uh, and, and where things may be going this year. And, and one of the things I want to say off the bat is that, you know, investing does not work on a calendar year. Uh, themes build over a period of time. They have periods of consolidation. Uh, and if they are strong, they reemerge even stronger. Uh, and I think we've spent a lot of time talking over the past year about some of the big structural changes that are taking place in markets, uh, some of the big thematic uh, uh, powers that are having an impact on securities overall. Uh, and so we're going to just explore that a little bit today um, and look at some of the sort of leadership themes as they relate to the bigger picture, bigger structural themes uh, and where investors might want to position and what things that they they might consider avoiding. Uh, and I'm excited about the fact that we've moved into a new year. Um, we are, of course, in another Omicron wave. And in Ontario here in Canada, you know, it is becoming a little more draconian again. Uh, but I am hopeful that it will not be for the same kind of period that we saw last year, uh, because Omicron is, is coming quite quickly. And hopefully it will burn its way out. And I think the market can give us some clues on that. So just to start out, as, as most people know, we have a big belief that 80% of return comes from getting to the right asset classes, the ones that are well suited to the current environment. And then within those asset classes, identifying big structural themes that have a tailwind that maybe aren't completely overowned by investors, uh, where there's opportunity for new money to get positioned. And often when that starts, it can go on for a really long time because, of course, people don't come to the same conclusions at the same times. They build a view uh, and consensus uh, slowly forms. And so I think that that's really important to consider. You know, most importantly, in the big asset classes, we see that it takes years and years for big structural themes to play out in equities. We've talked about the bull market of the 1980s and 90s as a period where innovation uh, emerged uh, and U.S. equities went from being hated after 15, 14 years of a bear market to universally loved. And of course, by that time it was over uh, and market had to consolidate for many years to 2013 actually to make a new high. And it was similar after the Second World War in the early 1950s, the market rallied for 16 years, but it started coming out of a very difficult period in, in world history. Uh, and reflation began. Of course, the baby boom got going uh, and demanded all kinds of products and housing and so on, and it fueled reflation in the economy. And, and so that lasted 16 years. So uh, we made a new high in 2013. Uh, it, here we are in 2022. So we're sort of nine years into this. It's not lost on me that the, the millennial cohort, which is actually bigger than the baby boom, appear to me making their way into family life uh, and family formation. And that can have a big impact on things like autos and cars and so on, uh, and, and inflation in general. Um, so we think we're in a bull market and we think that there is you know, a ways to go, but certainly um, there are always people that worry that it's gonna be over. And there's always people that disbelieve that it could get better. But as it is and has been, we have had a structural tailwind in US equities now for nine years. And in other parts of the world, maybe a little bit shorter, uh, and that might present an interesting opportunity, uh, but equities would be a place that we, we want to continue to focus. And in fixed income, you know, we've been making a case that we've went through 
uh, 40 years of falling interest rates. And that helped people to come to a consensus as to what to own in that world and to a consensus that rates would stay lower for longer. And I think that we've been going through a bottoming period over the last four years, probably punctuated by the low in yields during the pandemic, where we've been making a shift from a disinflationary world to a reflationary world. And so it's helpful to go back and look at what happened in the 1950s and 60s in the early stages of reflation in that period of time, because again, what worked then was sort of different than the things that worked over the last several years. We also have had a view that commodity prices uh, were bottoming. Now, just if, you, if we follow along on those themes, this is the TLH, this is the, the, uh, the, the 10 to 20 year US Treasury bond. This was the high in price at the pandemic bottom. And in general, bond prices have been falling since then. Certainly after the first big push lower, bond prices consolidated from March of last year until September, October, uh, and then made a lower high, pulled back, made a lower high, and certainly in the first couple of days of the year are taking a bit of a powdering as people rotate and reconsider their holdings as to what might work. Last year was one of the very few years in history where bonds gave a negative return. We had a negative view on bonds all through the course of the year. And I think it calls into question the validity of a 60-40 portfolio where 40% of the money is in fixed income. Certainly, I don't think we have any, any clients who are set up that way, and I can't perceive that we would be there anytime soon. If you get a very low interest rate and falling bond prices, it's pretty hard to make money. Uh, and I think that when you consider that there's 50% more US dollars today than there was a year ago, and we've got inflation running north of 6%, whether it's transitory or not, if you're getting two or 3% in income against 6% inflation, you're losing money. So bonds continue to look unfavorable. And this is the aggregate bond market, the bond index that takes into account various issuers, the issuer qualities uh, and various terms to maturity. And the aggregate bond index really worked this way lower all through the year. And actually, as we speak today, is just making a new low uh, having finished this little consolidation. So. Uh, money is clearly is rotating away from bonds and there's lots of money that has to be in the bond market at insurance companies and banks and so on. But there are also lots of discretionary owners of banks and probably will look at their statements this year and say banks, did, sorry, the uh, bonds, the bonds didn't do me much good. Uh, maybe I should consider something else for my yield oriented money. Commodity prices, we made a case last year that we were going through a generational bottoming and uh, the 10 year returns for commodities leading up to uh, 2020 were in the neighborhood of minus 9% a year. It was about a 75% collapse in commodity prices from 2009 going forward. And after making that low, just about actually 77% off the highs, this is the RJI index, which is an unweighted index of commodities, various commodities, food commodities, metals commodities, and so on. Uh, Really, commodities have been steadily marching ahead and now have are at a point where the positive the return for 10 years is now positive. But as we point out, you know, you may get to a point where the 10 year return is 15 to 20 percent, as opposed to almost zero where we are today. But commodity prices in general are now above their long term moving averages and the moving averages have turned higher. And I would say that's the very early stages. Of a, of a commodity cycle and it could go on a long time. It's certainly a group that's unloved. Um, it's certainly there has been pressure, ESG pressure on commodity producing companies to consider their environmental footprint. And that's something that's gonna continue to be a, a major issue, but certainly they became an asset that was unloved. And maybe there are structural changes in the world that will change that. One of them might be electric vehicles, which demand all kinds of nickel and copper to produce, and I think that's becoming an unstoppable force. Uh, but there are certainly other needs, infrastructure assets uh, and, uh, and uh, home building and so on that put pressure on commodity prices. We've talked about the fact that the Russell 2000 generally has a pretty strong start to the year. Uh, Russell 2000 has a tendency to outperform the S&P from November through April, May. And the stock market has a tendency to perform well through that period as a whole. If we take the S&P, 
Uh, S&P 500 made its seasonal low in October, which it often does. It was a relatively mild decline. We thought that might be the case, about 6.6%. Rallied out of there into early, uh, into uh, late November. You often get a little bit of turbulence late November, early December. Of course, we finished with the Christmas rally as we trade today. We're sitting at a new all-time high in the S&P 500. So at the, at the surface level, that looks pretty good making new all-time highs. For a stock to go from $50 to 100, it has to go through 51, 52, 58, 64, 75. New all-time highs are not scary. It means that things are going well. We're always watching for change, but wind appears to be at our back. And when we look at volatility, there was a spike in volatility in December. Uh, another little spike in the middle of December to a lower high. Interesting, the S&P made a low uh, on December the 4th, when it made a lower low later in December, volatility did not respond in the same way. That gave us some clues that probably this, the power of the sell-off was waning, that the market was starting to look beyond, you know, an Omicron wave, which of course, you know, markets look around corners. Uh, they look out many months from today. It's not about what's happening today. It's about what might be happening, you know, in spring, summer. Uh, and volatility has ebbed away from there. We're back into the low end of the band, which tends to be quite a productive period of time for stocks. Uh, when we look at the NASDAQ, NASDAQ certainly uh, came out of the November, sorry, the October lows and rallied nicely into new highs. I will say that relative to the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100 has started to lag a little. And you can see even in the last five or six days, has not been able to make forward progress. You can see the relative strength versus the S&P has been falling. And even though we thrusted back towards highs, the power of the thrust was significantly weaker. So that's something that we're keeping in mind because we know that a lot of companies in the NASDAQ had 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% corrections from February to the end of the year. The largest cap of the large uh, technology companies held in quite well, but even they have not been enough to move the NASDAQ 100 on to new highs. So this is a chart we showed in the middle of December where the NASDAQ was working its way higher, but the percentage of stocks trading above their long-term moving average was falling, meaning fewer and fewer stocks were carrying the day. When you only have 35% of the companies in an index trading above its long-term uptrend, that's not that healthy a condition. As we sit today, it's a little better. 38% of stocks are uh, trading above their 200 day. This is their 150 day moving average and it's rising, but it's not had tremendous power. So we're only two days into the new year. Perhaps it is that through the tax loss selling that took place into the end of the year, there hasn't been a lot of new money brought to bear, but I think in people positioning their portfolios are considering the impact of higher rates and when you look at the things that impact are impacted by a higher rate, it's things that trade at a high multiple or a high few, uh, multiple of future earnings. And you discount them back to the present with a higher interest rate means they're worth a little bit less. So that's something that we certainly are watching. And we have had an underweighted position in technology, I think as most people know, for several months. When you look at the unprofitable part of technology, the part with promise of the future, this is the ARKK ETF. This is Kathy Wood's flagship companies with promise for the future, but with little revenue or little earnings. The ARKK is off 43% uh, from the highs. And as of today, really not catching any bid, trading right in and around the lows. This is something that bears watching. A lot of people might have expected at the end of tax loss selling that, that this might pick up. Um, we are very cautious on unprofitable tech because we think rates are going to continue to move higher, which puts pressure on unprofitable companies. When we look at the equally weighted S&P, though, that's actually quite a good picture. Uh, at equally weighted S&P rallied out of the hole in, in uh, October, consolidated a little through December. When the S&P 500 made a new low following the December 4th low, the equally weighted S&P did not. 
That means it was the largest cap companies in the S&P that took it to make a lower low. The average company in the S&P did not. That's a good thing. And we see we're making new all-time highs today. Now, when the middle of December, when we looked at our breadth readings, this is actually the early part of December, we highlighted the fact that we were a little bit cautious. Uh, we needed to see some of these things get better. The percent of stocks and the NYC and uptrends had been a little bit in decline. It means the breadth of the market was weakening. Same thing was happening globally. And some of the shorter term indicators were doing the same. Now, in our December 21st call, we mentioned that these short term indicators had turned, back, turned higher as did the NYSE bullish percent. And as we sit today, it's a totally different picture. We did get that typical Santa Claus rally. We've come into the new year on a very solid footing. Doesn't mean things can't change, but it means we have the wind at our back. The percent of stocks globally that are in long term uptrends has been rising over the last few weeks. Percent of stocks in the NYSE and uptrends has been rising. And the percent of stocks trading above their shorter term moving averages, 50 day moving average is rising nicely. Percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum is rising nicely. Percent of stocks making new highs versus the stocks making new lows, again, improving. And the percent of stocks in the NYSE trading above their 150 day moving average is sitting at about 60%. Again, comparing that to the NASDAQ 100 at 34%, it means internally, the companies that trade in the NYSE, which tend to be more real economy companies, are performing better than the technology group or the high multiple stocks in the NASDAQ. So let's look at leadership, right? We can talk economic data all day long and we'll do lots of that over the course of the year. We know that as we were finishing the year, employment data was pretty good. Inflation data was a little hot. Some of the PMI data was pretty strong. Um, and as a result, some of the economically sensitive groups were starting to lift, maybe looking beyond Omicron. Our job isn't to be everywhere. Our job is to target. We're a tactical manager. So our job is to find market leadership groups where breadth is expanding, where money is getting put to work and focus in those areas. We look every day to try and identify groups that maybe are showing some change where leadership is waning or new leadership is emerging. And then in the absence of leadership where breadth is deteriorating, we're a tactical manager. Our job is to have a bit of cash or maybe exit big parts of the market. That is not the case today. We are pretty fully invested. When we look at the leadership groups we've talked about over time, I want to look at the long-term picture and the short-term picture. The long-term picture last year, we highlighted that early in the year, banks, this is the KBE, large bank index from the S&P 500, made its first new high since rolling over in 2008. So often when you make a new high, you correct. But these are monthly bars. We are slowly working our way higher. And as we sit today, looks very, very constructive. Not only did we break out of a 13 year bear market where there was no advance, just like the stock market did between 1966 and 82. When it turned, it was in a new bull market. Well, I would say we are in a new bull market in financial services companies. So if we look at the Canadian bank index, very strong, making a new high today, up about 2% early on in the day. When we look at Royal Bank of Canada, it's been very strong, TD Bank, very strong. Morgan Stanley actually from here has lifted. Um, the, the, the financial services group looks very strong. Across the board, banks, insurance companies, asset managers up one and a half to two and a half percent today. Technology. So technology has been a little bit sloppy. This is the XLK, which is heavily weighted by the very largest of large cap stocks. So Apple is about 20% of the XLK. And it has come back to highs, relative strength versus the market, really not making much progress right now. So we have to watch that, but we have to respect it because these companies have been game changers. Apple trading virtually at a new high, trading better than 94% of companies in the S&P in the last year, and relative strength rose all the way through November, December. 
So this is an important holding for us and continues to be. Semiconductors were an important theme through the year. And while relative strength isn't making progress, we're trading virtually at highs. So this is an important group. Now the semiconductor companies have a short turn cycle. The orders come in quickly if the economy is getting stronger and they go away quickly if the economy starts to weaken. We know there's been a shortage of supply of semiconductors. And we know, especially within the semiconductor group, the semiconductor manufacturing equipment companies are really, really performing well because there's a shortage of chips and we're moving to smaller and smaller chip dimensions, which mean that they become more power efficient and, more, and faster. Uh, and so those companies continue to perform well. But looking across the valley to software, software has been underperforming for weeks. And this includes a lot of companies that had very predictable business models. They get a subscription fee that is paid monthly. And that was wonderful when we worried about global growth. But if we think that we're in a world where growth could pick up, having something that operates in a steady state is less attractive. And so software has been a more difficult place to be. Now, I think it's interesting. We highlighted this in the middle of December. Energy relative to software equally weighted had started to underperform through the course of last year. So energy relative to software outperforming, economically sensitive versus more defensive. That's an important theme to pick up on. The XEG, which is the index of Canadian oil and gas producers made a new high today. Relative strength has been rising steadily. It's economically sensitive. And we know that finding new reserves has been elusive over the last, uh, over the last year. Canadian natural resources that basically consolidated through the month of December, no, October, November, December, seems to be catching a bid. And the XOP, which is the US oil and gas exploration and production companies, up 3% today, breaking, breaking this little consolidation that had been going on through October, November. Very important because if we think we're going into a major lockdown and that the economic activity is gonna stall out, you would not expect to see oil and gas companies performing well. Markets telling us that investors are positioning for what's coming next. And next might be a bit of a shortage. You know, in 2020, Globally, we found 12 and a half billion barrels of oil in 2021, 4.7 billion. It's the lowest number of barrels found since 1946. If we have a pickup in activity and a pickup in demand, there could be a squeeze coming and it's possible that the companies are recognizing that. But the long-term picture is we're a long way from highs. The XOP index, was down about 90% from 2014 through the bottom in early 2020. Now we were fortunate because we avoided energy all through that period. In fact, in our macro strategy, we were short through that decline. But we're in a different picture today. I know ESG is against carbon-based energy, but we're gonna need it for a while. And the XOP is now trading above all of its long-term moving averages, has consolidated for several months, and now turning higher. I think that looks pretty good for 2022. So this is an important group and a group that we've been adding to. Industrials. This is an equally weighted basket of industrial companies, consolidated nicely from February through September, after a giant run-up from October through the end of 2020. So things don't go straight higher. And after consolidating broke out, pulled back a little bit, but again, an economically sensitive group, not exactly getting hurt by the prospect, prospect of Omicron. And if we look at some of the companies within this group, because our job is to try to identify the best securities within sectors that have a tailwind, i point out large holdings at the firm include General Dynamics making a new all-time high today and Textron within a whisper of a new all-time high, trading better than 90% of companies in the S&P in the past year. Probably has something to do with the fact that operating margins continue to work their way higher. There's leverage in the business model. Let's move on to materials. Materials is a very small group in the market but it's one that could be incredibly important if commodity prices are working their way higher. 
the XLB index, which is the material sector spider ETF, made a new all-time high today. This is an under-owned group. And something that we've talked about, that commodities relative to equities have been an underperforming asset since 2008, where they peaked out. We had a, a low in materials versus the versus equities in the in the uh, beginning of the um, in the beginning of the uh, tech rollover, and the same thing happened in the early 1970s as inflation started to pick up. So this might be a very important thing. This little lift that we had in the last year is not what we're talking about. We're talking about being there for a structural move in the asset class relative to other asset classes that could generate significant returns going forward. So when we look at, for instance, the, the miners, and this includes all types of mining, we know that after breaking out to a new all-time high last year, they consolidated through the course of the year, but they definitely have turned back higher here. And if we pull the lens back a little bit further, like the banks, this is only just beginning. This is a bear market that has gone on for a long time. Made a low in 2016, made a higher low in 2020, bottom of the pandemic. And if you look at what has happened to the large mining companies coming out of other commodity bear markets, in many cases, the large companies went up by 10 times. So this is not about 15% or 20%. And I know it's hard to wait over the course of a few months while they consolidated. But if they are truly beginning their next leg, this upcoming next number of months could be very, very important. We know we talked about the fact that copper speculators, while the group was consolidating, took their holdings down. It's what happens. They get bored. They move on. But now we have this group turning higher. This is the shares of Freeport McMoran, one of the largest copper producers in the world. They also produce a lot of gold. Very long life asset based in Indonesia, in, the, in the Indonesia. And going back to that same long-term picture, just coming out of that very long-term structure. So if copper prices moved from $4.30 to $6, the profitability in these companies, including Freeport, goes through the roof. The cash that gets generated is enormous, and they will almost always pay extra dividends with that cash flow, everybody loves to see those extra dividends. Consumer, important group in the US market. This is an equally weighted ETF, meaning that all companies are weighted the same. In consumer discretionary companies, it takes out the big impact of Amazon. Group consolidated through the course of summer and fall, moved on to make new highs, trading above all long-term moving averages, just exceeded the high from early in December today. And Certainly, there are areas within this group that have been more difficult than others. We've talked about Ford all year long, has had just a giant day today, up almost 9%. The car companies look particularly well-suited because, of course, they're making major transition to the next generation of automobile, and demand has been very strong. Supply has been very weak, so the profitability is good. The home builders also trading virtually at new highs. Two groups that might be the target of purchases by millennials if they are in the family formation uh, uh, um, uh, experience. And we think that these two areas are particularly interesting when it comes uh, to this upcoming year. Century Community is one of the companies that we own based in the, in the Southern US, but focused on first time home buyers. Could be very interesting if we're in the early stages of this new cohort Forming, fam forming families. Lowe's companies, which is also in home improvement, much like Home Depot, also performing really well, better than 93% of companies in the market. This is leadership in the market. So let's talk just a little bit about that concept for a moment. We know that at the end of the First World War, the percentage change in the US population dropped dramatically, both from the war and from, frankly, the pandemic of 1918. When that turned, it fueled the roaring 20s. We had a similar low coming out of the 1930s and into the early 1940s. And as the baby boom really got going, big percentage point growth. And that led to a bull market between 1951 and 66 that was really sort of unstoppable. So certainly the percentage growth in the population has been impacted by a higher death rate 
coming out of COVID. But certainly it's also been impacted by the fact that millennials have formed families later on. Uh, but doesn't take much of a change in the percentages here to impact consumption in the economy, something we want to watch closely. So multifamily residential REITs performing really well. We talked about REITs doing well toward the end of the year. And certainly this is one that is, continues to be interesting. And also in the REITs, the industrial REITs, granite REIT is something that we think is quite interesting also. So lots to do in equities. Now let's talk about yields a little bit. This is the, five, the yield on a five-year U.S. government bond. It's been working its way higher steadily all year long, and as of today, at a new high. So five-year yields certainly going higher. This is the RDVY ETF. It's an ETF of companies that historically have been able to grow their dividend at a rapid pace. We spent all year long talking about the fact that in rising rates, you need rising dividend streams to offset. A high dividend that is not growing is far less attractive than one that is smaller but growing because it's all about total return. How much do the shares go up plus how much does the growth in dividend help us? Because we, if we're in a reflationary environment and the purchasing power of, 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 of uh, currency is going down, we need a high rising stream of income. Let's compare that to what's happening in high dividend paying stocks. That's the super dividend ETF made up of global companies that pay a high dividend. You can see falling relative strength all through the year. And a big difference, I would prefer to focus in this area where the market tells us there's new money going to work. And this could go on for a long time. This in the 1950s and 60s, dividend growth led the market for 20 years until Everybody decided that this was the thing to own and they were the nifty 50 and eventually in the early 1970s, that was over. But they traded at 70 to 90 times earnings for having that strength in able, being able to grow their dividend companies like Walmart, McDonald's, which eventually of course did correct, but they went higher for 20 years. On the other hand, we could own the aggregate bond index just to refresh what that looks like, not so attractive. Uh, and one that would tell me that I really don't want to focus on just straight yields that don't grow. I'd like to focus on something that has a rising dividend stream. So a few more points. Another place we can go for a rising yield, I pointed out a little bit earlier, are some of the upstream large cap uh, commodity producing companies. This is an ETF, GUNR, trading virtually at a new high pays a 3.6% um, uh, dividend and one that will likely grow as cash flow grows in these companies. This is an investment in Exxon, Chevron, Nutri, and Archer Daniels, uh, BHP Group. You can see the list, the largest of the large cap commodity producers. I think we're still relatively very early stages as we talked about earlier about commodities. So it's interesting, high multiple stocks, versus low multiple stocks had been starting to underperform late in the year. And I would just highlight that as of today, the value factor MSCI ETF is making a sharp new high. So leadership, leadership is cyclical. Leadership is economically sensitive. Leadership is companies that have an ability to raise price in many cases, take price on top of inflation to increase profitability uh, and increase the dividends that they pay out and increase the shares that they buy back. But leadership moving into 2022 is very much the same as what it was in the early part of 2021 before we saw consolidation. And I think we're making a move into the next leg now. These were the holdings that we had at the end of the year Financials are close to 30%. I can tell you that we have taken our financials weight down by about 5%, and not because we don't like financials, but because we're seeing an acceleration in materials, which we moved up to an 11% weight, which is significant because it's four times the market weight in the S&P. We've also taken up uh, our energy weight so far in the new year. So again, it's about four times the market's weight. 
the rest of the portfolio is relatively the same other than some small increase in consumer discretionary because we are seeing uh, a willingness to continue to spend money and a willingness for investors to focus in some of the consumer discretionary stocks like the auto stocks and like the housing stocks. What do we have coming at us? We're into the seasonally strongest period of the year. Santa Claus rally did arrive. We started out the first two days of the year with rotation taking place in the market. There are plenty of institutions that looks like taking down their growth holdings, increasing their value holdings, becoming more economically sensitive than less. But generally the flows into the market are the strongest at the beginning of the year. 134% on average of all the new money coming into the market comes in in the month of January. It continues to come in in February, March, and April, and then tends to flow out somewhat through the summer and into fall, which is what causes some of the seasonality. Well, we are into that strongest period. We know that the share buybacks that were authorized through the course of 2021 were the most significant in history. We don't have year end figures yet, but the number will be higher than the one we're looking at now. We know that in the caution in late November and early December and the beginning of Omicron, portfolio managers in general raise their cash position quite substantially meaning that money has to get put back to work. So we're very happy to get defensive and take money out of the market, exit big themes if they stop working. As we can see it now, the themes we're focused in are working. I'm excited by the fact that it looks like we've begun that next leg of the reflation cycle. The market's looking beyond Omicron to what may come next. And while we would love it that returns come 1% a month, we know that that's not how it works. And when you have a huge run like we did from November to April in the cyclical stocks, they were bound to correct for a few months before resuming, which it certainly looks like they're doing now. So with that, uh, we can open it up to questions. Um, but uh, here we are in a new year. We'll be doing these calls every Tuesday uh, from here to the end of the year. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, January the 20th, we will be doing a full year review of 2021, what worked and what didn't uh, in all the specific mandates and products that we manage. So with that, Pam, if you have, uh, have any questions, happy to answer them. Thanks so much, David. Yes, we've had a few questions come in. The first is Paul from Paul in Toronto. He's curious to know um, what barometer, either an asset or a stock, performed the worst in 2021 in our portfolios. What performed the worst? Yeah. Well, I can tell you that the most difficult uh, trade that we had in 2021 was our energy position because we built a good sized energy position through uh, winter and into spring. And then it rolled over and had a really good sized pullback and basically shook us out of the position. So if there was one frustration, that was the biggest frustration. And it always becomes a conversation because while we're trying to stay in structural themes, we run stop losses on all our positions. And if they start to roll over, you know, our first job is to stop our way out. And once in a while we get whipsawed and we for sure got whipsawed in, in, that, in, in, in the equity portion of our portfolios. Now, we didn't get shaken out everywhere. We didn't get shaken out in our balance mandate. We didn't get shaken out in our macro strategy. Um, but we certainly did get shaken out in the equities. That was probably the biggest frustration of the year. And, and I think the other frustration would be that in people terms, in people terms, five or six months of consolidation is difficult. Uh, in market terms, it's just the way that it works. So, uh, you know, patience is, is a bigger one. Thanks so much, David. This is a really interesting question. One of uh, the more interesting ones I've seen in a while. Sorry, I'm just, I can't quite hear you, Pam. Oh, okay, sorry, Dave, can you hear me now? I got you now. Okay, perfect. So this question comes from Jeff. He's curious to know, does the economic news today that four and a half million Americans quit their jobs in November confirm that the great resignation is an ongoing factor in the US economy. Is this number a leading or a lagging indicator?
indicator? Well, that's a that's a great question. Yeah, I think, I think that so. I think that we are seeing uh, an economy that is in transition, and there are industries that are on their way out, and people who worked in them are fed up in them. So a lot of people who have been in retail or in restaurant service, um, relatively low paying jobs with difficult futures are saying, I'm, I'm over it. And they're moving into, you know, the gig economy. They might be moving over into some of the companies where they can work when they want, where they want. Um, we also know that there's a giant mismatch in demand for engineers uh, and people with science degrees uh, and mathematics degrees uh, versus you know, people who have moved out of some of those other industries. And so, so it's going to take some time for that mismatch to close. Um, the fact that there are so many open jobs right now tells you there is demand for employees and probably wages are going to be impacted. Um, but the fact that there are people leaving jobs is not a bad thing. They're, they're, they're confident they're going to be able to find something else. Interesting. Thanks so much, David. Next question comes from Loretta. She wants to know, what are the advantages of a company doing a share buyback as opposed to using the funds to be invested into growing their business? And we often talk about this, so love to That's hear. That's a great question. Today. So um, if a company is confident that the market doesn't understand the true value of their shares and they know their business, they may well be happy to buy back their own shares uh, and happier to do that than to buy a company that they don't know. You know, often a takeover is met with a lot of excitement, but becomes, you know, more difficult to execute uh, after the fact. I like share buybacks because in the end of the day, after share buybacks, there's more earnings per share after the fact than there were before. We're sharing the earnings with fewer shareholders. Um, I would always prefer to see a company so confident to say it's going to go on for a long time. So we're going to raise our dividend. And that's why we spend a lot of time looking for companies that raise their dividends regularly, because it means they're confident they're going to be able to continue to pay that dividend. Um, but share buybacks are a return of capital to shareholders. It means that those that want to sell can redeploy that money into something they think is a better opportunity. Um, and that's the way capitalism works. You know, you give, you give, uh, give money easy passing lanes and, uh, and share buybacks help to do that. Thanks so much, Dave. Last question from Sebastian. He says, nice to see you back, Dave. Happy new year. Any thoughts on steel? Yeah, look, you know, steel, steel is one of those basic materials groups that certainly, you know, has been consolidating. And let me just see if I can flip over here. So if we were to take a long-term view of the SLX index, which is the steel index, um, this is what the group looks like. Like the metals, it broke out early in the year and then pulled back and consolidated. Um, if we look at the shorter term picture, you know, it's in this channel. I'd like to see it back above the 150 and 200 day moving averages. If we look at some of the leading stocks, like say a new core, new core is, is performing really, really well. And again, we look at the long-term picture, you know, it's, it's really come out. Cleveland cliffs, a little bit more economically sensitive, you know, pull back a little bit more, but I think that if this whole cyclical group, uh, it gets going and it's certainly been lifting over the last few weeks that this should be uh, a good group to be focused on. There's still co-holdings. So look, I think that the risk reward here is probably pretty good. Thanks, David. Well, that concludes the questions we've received this evening. And as always, I leave you with the final word. Thank you so much again. Look, I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to watch these videos. Uh, I enjoy doing them. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to make sure that people understand what we're thinking. Um, there's a lot of ways to, to skin a cat and we have one approach, um, but um, despite the fact that it means our portfolios don't always move in lockstep with the market, it means that if there are big structural moves, we will participate in them. And uh, after you've had a consolidation like we had from the spring toward the fall of last year, it's great to see these themes reaccelerate uh, because the kind of themes that they are right now are themes that have big moves. 
And so patience sometimes is warranted. Um, we'll continue to do these through the year. If you've got topics that you'd like us to cover, please make sure you send them in. If you'd like to have a conversation with us, uh, one of our counselors or with one of our investment team, myself included, uh, let us know. We're happy to have conversations. Uh, and uh, if you want to send us an email, we'll certainly respond that way as well. So thanks very much for everybody joining and we'll look forward to next week and look forward to what we hope will be a productive 2022. Thanks very much, Pam.